Those who are pregnant outside the policy absolutely must have labor induced and should be dragged down and sterilized. This shocking statement hung on a large banner strung across a major highway in China where forced abortion and forced eugenics is still the norm. Today, Asia, Eastern Europe, and the Caribbean all have the highest abortion rates in the world, and all are either formerly or currently communist. In this speech, I will demonstrate the hidden connections between abortion and communism, and explain the critical importance of why United States citizens should be aware of this connection, if we hope to end abortion. Did you know that one of the most highly used suction abortion machines in America today was originally designed in the Soviet Union by the Bolsheviks? In 1918, Lenin announced, quote, the success of a revolution depends on how much women take part in it. Part of Lenin's agenda was to destroy the family unit so that there would be more women free for the workforce. Abortion would facilitate this end. Shortly after Lenin's proclamation, Soviet Russia in 1920 was the first country to legalize abortion without restriction. Lenin used various elements of propaganda in hopes of establishing communism, first in Russia and then throughout the world. As part of these efforts, he deliberately agitated for abortion and divorce, calling them forms of liberation. All of Lenin's policies and ideas degrade the dignity of men, women, and children and disregard God's design for human life. Communism is an atheistic, amoral, revolutionary system of belief. It seeks the overthrow of capitalism, a worldwide proletarian revolution and dictatorship, and diminishes human dignity and human life. As such, it can never be compatible with God's plan for man. The state becomes God, and man its servant. Karl Marx once said that he wished to destroy the existing world order and stride through the wreckage of creator. He wanted to create a race of supermen. Similarly, Margaret Sanger, founder of Planned Parenthood, desired an ideal eugenic state and proposed using birth control to create a race of thoroughbreds. She claimed that only 30% of the population was fit for life and that the other 70% deemed feeble-minded, mental, and moral degenerates secondary to inferior genes should be moved to farms, communes, and homesteads where they would be forcibly confined and prohibited from reproducing. Sanger, who was also a member of the Women's Committee for the New York Socialist Party and founder of a feminist socialist magazine called The Woman Rebel, eagerly awaited the day when the working class would seize control of the United States, communist style. As editor of the Birth Control Review, she presented her ideas of a pure race of those who fit her worldview and even once said that her purpose was not to depreciate efforts to create a socialist society, but to promote them, stating, quote, unless the pivotal importance of birth control is recognized in any program of reconstruction, all efforts to create a new world and a new civilization are foredoomed to failure. The UN Population Fund claims that they propagate voluntary family planning laws in China, but in reality, many provinces still mandate forced abortions. While the Chinese Communist Party modified its planned birth policy to allow two children, it is just as heinously and rigorously enforced as the previous one-child policy. The tax for an illegal child is currently two to ten times the annual household income. It may take citizens several decades to pay fines as heavy as this. Stephen Mosier, president of the Population Research Institute, in testimony before the United States Congress indicated that, quote, the Chinese Communist Party remains firmly in control of fertility as ever. The Chinese state, rather than the Chinese people, decides how many children are to be born in China each year. Signs have been hung in public places and even painted on the exterior walls of houses supporting the state's family planning policy threatening dire consequences to those who do not cooperate. According to the signs, such punishments may include imprisonment, property destruction, and the loss of one's house. But why should we be concerned with communism in other countries, and how does it affect abortions in the United States? If abortion is one among many vehicles used by communists to bring out their agenda, then United States citizens have particular reason to be alarmed. 
First, Lenin's agenda, things like undermining marriage, blurring the lines between male and female, trying to disintegrate the family unit, and commissioning people to drum up cultural agitation to promote a new world order, are all socialistic elements currently identifiable in the United States society today. This is critical to understand. Next, during the 2016 presidential election, one of the major front runners was a self-avowed democratic socialist. Yet another once studied the Saul Alinsky method of social agitation and promoted other ideas that would have put the United States on a trajectory towards increased socialistic policies. Godless socialism is linked to abortion. Thus, we must expose the errors of both and eradicate these two evils from our world. As one pro-life advocate said, we must understand that abortion is a crisis of faith and a battle that must be fought first on our knees with prayer and with love. Dr. Martin Luther King once said, whom you would change, you must first love. We must prayerfully humble ourselves to reclaim and reestablish a society based on God's laws, not those of men. By electing God-fearing pro-life candidates who are firmly opposed to socialism, we can help make the United States the moral world leader that it once was. Just as America was the country that brought communism to its knees, let America also be the country that ends the scourge of eugenics and abortion. In the end, there will be victory. If Christ wins, we win, and Christ cannot lose. Thank you. All a little bit more than the skin on our bones. We are so much more than just tissue. God made us all different, but in his image. In Genesis 1.27, it says, So God created mankind in his image. In the image of God, God created them. Male and female, he created them. All right, so I'm going to talk about how the embryo grows into something so much more than just tissue. Here's how we all grew up in the first three months. In month one, when life begins, when our egg is fertilized, we become a new, unique person. Between weeks three and four, our heart begins to beat. Arm and leg buds formed, our eyes, ears, nose, and mouth begin to take form. In month two, our brain, cell, or our brain waves could be detected. Our body and blood circulation are well established. All organs were present and most are already functioning. Fingernails are visible and we could curl our fingers around an object. We could also take up had taste buds and tooth buds in our gums. Month three, we could smile, make funny faces, we practiced breathing in amniotic fluid in and out of our lungs. All 20 teeth are were formed and waiting to develop. Knowing this, I went on a Planned Parenthood website and I looked up how they described the easy procedure to remove the tissue. In the early months of the pregnancy, it's pretty crazy how they word this horrific murder of an innocent child into seven easy step steps. Here are the last three steps of a suction abortion. They insert a thin tube through the curved cervix of your uterus that use a small handheld suction suction device or suction machine to gently remove the tissue. They may also use a small surgical tool called a curette to remove any tissue that's left in your uterus or to check to make sure your uterus is completely empty. By now it's obvious an unborn child is more than just tissue, but I'll continue because abortions continue after three months. Here's how we all grew in the second trimester. In month four, we were about eight inches long, our movements could be felt by our mother, and we could suck our thumb. We had fingerprints. Month five, we weighed about 15 ounces, hearing was very acute, and we swam around in the anomic fluid. We had eyebrows. Mm -hmm. Month six, by now we have gained another pound, our hand coordination has increased, and our eyes have opened. Again, looking at a Planned Parenthood website, it all seems so simple. They describe abortions after 16 weeks in this way. They insert a thin tube through the cervix of your uterus, then they use a combination of medical tools and a suction device to gently take out those pregnancy tissues from your uterus. Those so-called medical tools are actually used to cut up the baby because the parts are too big to remove by suction. 
Did you know that when it's done, they actually piece the baby back together so they know that all the parts are out? If you don't believe me, just go on YouTube to the Live Action Channel and look at the video Uncovering America's Late Term Abortion Industry and listen for yourself. A woman who was 24 weeks went in the clinic posing as a potential patient and here's part of the conversation they had. When asked whether or not it would come out whole, the doctor said, um, it depends. Every case is a little different because the medications we give you will help do different things. Um, but it's more common that it comes out in pieces. We use a combination of suction than the real instruments to literally go in and grab pieces out. When asked if, we, if it was fully developed at 24 weeks, they said, um, it's not fully developed. It doesn't even look like a baby yet. How can somebody lie like that? Not only do babies, do they look like babies at 24 weeks, but they can and do live outside the womb at 24 weeks. I know twins that were 24 weeks when they were born. That's 16 weeks early, and they were less than a pound and a half each, but they're fully functioning adults now. One is my sister Kristen's boyfriend. Wow. <laughs> it breaks my heart that babies that have a heartbeat can move and so much more are killed. And it's as easy as paying money to a doctor. Thankfully, it's becoming harder to get an abortion after 27 weeks and six days. Still, I was able to find a clinic in Maryland that does them at 28 weeks for what they call maternal fetal induction. Here's how abortion clinics, this abortion clinics work, describes their abortion procedures after 24 weeks. A DNC will be performed, a blood tip tube is inserted into the uterus. This tube is attached to a suction machine, which is turned on after the uterus has been emptied by gentle suction. A spoon-shaped instrument may be used to determine that the uterus is completely empty. So at month seven, our eyelashes were developing and fat continued to be deposited beneath the skin. Month eight, our irises could dilate and contract in response to light. Sleep and waking were more differentiated towards the end of the month. We weighed about four pounds. I myself was born at 35 weeks. And if I were born to somebody other than my mom, I could have been killed just for being an inconvenience. But for me, it hurts to know that there are babies out there that were just like me being killed because of somebody else's decision. At month nine, the rest of the rest of you weighed about seven to five to seven pounds and more would be put put on about half a pound a week. All organ systems were completely developed for birth. And do you want to hear the sad truth? If you go into an abortion clinic, it doesn't matter how far along you are, if you have the money and the right doctor, you can abort up to nine months in your pregnancy. We just went through all nine months, and I think it's absolutely crazy to call babies, unborn babies, just tissue. Here's what the Bible has to say about it. In Jeremiah 1.5, it says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you, before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to all nations. This verse shows how much God loves us and his children.
Second, they make embryos specifically for the purpose of embryonic stem cell research. Third, they were made from cloning by researchers used for stem cell research. So, what kinds of problems have they had using embryonic stem cells? Oh, here's one, they don't work. But more specifically, <laughs> one problem is that they have to use the medicine for the rest of their life or their body can reject the stem cell. Another problem is uncontrollable moving, twisting, arm flaring, head jerking, and non-stop chewing. This happens when they took fetal brain cells and put them in brains of patients with Parkinson's disease. This was reported in 2001 in the New England Journal of Medicine. Another problem that they had is they could turn into term tumors. They tried cloning mice, but the mice were genetically defective, so humans clones could also be genetically defective. So has anyone ever been cured using embryonic stem cells? No. For over 30 years they tried, and for over 30 years they failed. Even the people who support embryonic stem cell research have to admit that they've helped us do a whole lot of nothing. An article from the MIT Technology Review from 2016 actually said, and I quote, no field of biotechnology has promised more and delivered less in the ways of treatments than embryonic stem cells and only a handful of human studies have ever been carried out without significant results. Okay, so what is the difference between embryonic stem cells and other types of stem cells? These cells are pluripotent like the ones that are taken from embryos. They have the same ability to change into any cell in the human body. They learned how to do this in 2007 and they continued finding better ways to do this. Soon they hope to be able to reprogram any cell into whatever cell they need without using any stem cell. The main difference is that no one needs to die to get adult stem cells and they actually work and have been working for 50 years since 1968 when the first bone marrow transplant was successfully performed. What are some of the other ways stem cells have helped us? In 2013, the Daily Mail reported that Treating patients that had cartilage damage using umbilical cord blood stem cell led to 67% uh, improvement in tissue regeneration. In 2013, USA Today talked about a two-year-old girl in South Korea that received an artificial windpipe made from plastic in adult stem cells taken from her own bone marrow. In 2014, the Providence Journal in Rhode Island reported on several people whose lives were saved by bone marrow stem cell treatments for their leukemia from bone marrow donors. So, with all that success, why are scientists still obsessed with using it, destroying embryos? It doesn't make sense. But what if it actually worked? What if they found a way to use them? It would still be wrong. It's never right to take a life to save it. Mm -hmm. Us working together, it wouldn't have taken off like it is. So I thank everybody for their help. Okay. Thank okay. you. <laughs> okay, without further ado, I am going to start with the third place winner, and that is Abraham Hornbill. You did a goes to Sarah Hornbeck. And our first place winner is Michael Carson. And that concludes our oratory contest for this year. I hope our great role Rashard young lady, Julian, Julianne, yeah, yeah. take some good notes and show me up here next year. And you know, uh, these kids are invited to come on that bus. Yes, uh, our are. our entries. You, it's not yep. strictly just for the the Down high river for the area. school, right? So it's for everybody, from your all students. Um, I'd like to get a picture of everybody together. And did you all get t-shirts? Did they all get t-shirts? Okay. Did you get a t-shirt, Michael? No, I didn't. No, you didn't? Okay. Yeah, pick one.
precious feeder on the table over there. And thank you. Start with Ed, and he can tell us what's going on, or Debbie can tell us what's going on. <laughs> with hers. Okay. Up or Down River Right to Life has a few things, and you're all, everybody's always welcome to join us. Um, on Mother's Day, we have roses that are made available either through the office or through the different churches that do participate. And then um, we will have our Life Walk fundraiser, which we always do. Um, we'll be walking along Fort Street. Um, we haven't established, we haven't confirmed the date yet, but it will be probably in early June. We're hoping for June 9th. And so we walk up to the Crisis Pregnancy Center and back along Fort Street. Um, it used to be always in, in Wyandotte, around, along Biddle Avenue and Bishop Park, but we thought Fort Street will be much more visible And last year. It was, it was really nice. So. Uh, Watch for details if you're interested. Uh, it's, a, it's an important fundraiser for us. And then, of course, in the summer, 4th of July, we're in the parade in Wyandotte. I don't know if there are other parades going on in the summer that other affiliates are in, but that's a big one, and we like to have a, a, big, a good presence. And at the street fair in Wyandotte, um, that's actually run by the Resource Center, and um, I don't know if, if all of you have met Angie Maychag, the new uh, manager of the resource center, but because that's where we have our meetings and uh, we have we rent a little office there from Right to Life Michigan, um, uh, we see her a lot, and she's planning um, the display at the street fair in Wyandotte, and always needs people to help. You know, if you can do a, a couple of hour shift, that would be awesome, because uh, it's Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, so there's lots a couple of hours that we need to fill. And uh, she's doing a rummage sale. Um, the fundraiser, that fundraiser really helps to pay the rent for the Wayne County Resource Center there on Eureka in Wyandotte. And so if you've got rummage you want to donate, or if you can help with that, that's going to be, it's in May. And I'm not sure of the exact date. I'm sorry, I don't remember. <laughs> but um, I don't want you, I want you to be aware of it. And just give her a call and uh, uh, if you can help or if you're, in, if you're interested or know somebody that would like to make donations. Thank you. And Angie's very nice to speak with. Yes. Angie oh, and I she have communicated is. back and forth throughout this whole thing. It was a learning curve for both of us with the oratory. Just conference. for those of you who don't know, she is the daughter of Chris McDonald who ran the Resource Center for almost 20 years. So um, she applied for the job and was hired by Wright Tuff of Michigan. So, um, uh, it's in, it's kind of a family <laughs> activity there. Rose? Okay, thank you, Debbie. Yeah. And um, rather than repeat everything that Debbie said, because um, we do a lot of the same activities and we partner with them on a lot of things, just want to invite you to, if you're not already a member of Right to Life somewhere, to join us. We're actually an organization of church representatives, so of all denominations. And we, uh, although we do so, uh, support the political action of Right to Life of Michigan, we help fundraise for them so that they can help pass pro-life laws. We really try to focus on our churches as well so that the folks in our pews can hear the kind of information that these young people shared with us this morning because there's a huge gap in knowledge um, for, for even pro-lifers. They know they're pro-life, but they don't know how to articulate that position. And so there's a lot of education that's needed in the pews, and that's one of the main focuses of Right to Life. So join us, support us, um, you're invited. Okay. Last but not least, our gentleman, Joe, president of Southern Down River. One of the things we got going on is, uh, you're not involved with one of the affiliates, is next week, this week on Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, 
at uh, Legacy, Legacy Church, which is right across from Riverview High School. We're having a, our annual meeting for Southern Down River Right to Life. And we're bringing in Paul Miller, who is the chairman of the board of Right to Life Michigan. He's been chairman of the board for over 30 years doing Right to Life work. He's a tremendous speaker. If you've never heard of Paul Miller, uh, I urge you to try to get to that meeting. It's at 7 o'clock, Legacy Church, across from Riverview High School. We also do a pastor's luncheon in May. I don't have the exact date right now, but it's at noon. It'll be at the old Trenton Hotel. Um, it's called TV Diner, something now, but it's a beautiful spot for this. We'll have that. It'll be at noon. If you want to give me your email address before you leave, I'll make sure you get an invitation. We have we invite all the pastors in our in all three areas to come. It's really all three affiliates that are here today, and you're all welcome to come too. We want to mix people with their pastors, and it's about an hour and a half. It starts at 11:30. It's over by one, and we have a speaker coming up for that. It's always a nice thing. We do the parades and fairs too. It's very important, whatever affiliate you are involved with, that we show up for these parades and fairs so that people can see that there are other people. People are shy about this sometimes, and that they can see that other people are involved in right to life. So my next parade is in Trenton, Memorial Day weekend. And there's nothing finer than to be in Trenton on that Saturday morning. And we march, and if we can get 20, 30, 40 people and a couple decorated cars and stuff, it's a big deal. And we get a lot of applause. So if you're in Trenton that weekend, that'd be great too. Thank you very much. What about your golf outing? The golf outing is <laughs> in September. It's September 17th. The golf outing funds our combined bus trip to the March for Life in Washington. We charge the kids a half price for that. The golf owning finances, that'll be at Roseville Country Club on the 17th of September. We have a young lady I was talking to earlier today that went on the bus trip and gave her to Sheridan High School. So she paid half price. It cost us 110 bucks to get somebody on a bus charge the adults 110, <laughs> charge the kids 55. Thank you. Thank you, John. And one other thing that, uh, since you got to the fall, our Right to Life dinner will be um, October 4th, I think. I think it's October 4th, but you'll be getting information. And um, we had last year's winner from of this contest, Michael, got to give his speech at the dinner. So um, it's, it's a nice opportunity for our young people as well as the adults. And this year's speaker will be Ed Rivet from um, Right to Life of Michigan, our legislative uh, lobbyist. Director. <laughs>